Hey everyone, this is Ian. Welcome to the Empty Cup podcast. This is the podcast in which traditional and modern martial arts collide and we dissect what is left over. And we have as our guest today an interviewee, uh, Billy Brown. And Billy Brown's got a couple of different organizations and where he works through like with law enforcement and does all kinds of stuff in his community and around the nation, helping people understand weapons training and, and uh, JKD. Uh, and he's got his, um, he's got his, his um, foot in a, in a lot of different arts. And the reason why I had him on the program today was for a couple reasons. Uh, number one, I saw a YouTube video of his on training in JKD and trapping, and I turned it on, and I was really impressed with the way the guy moved and his understanding of JKD, and I thought, this is something that I want my audience to hear, uh, uh, you know, firsthand from him, but also, I one of the things that, and we were talking about this before the interview are, started, and that was, I really feel like JKD was an incomplete system, you know, and one of the things that was incomplete in is, is a weapons training kind of thing. It, it was really kind of as it left Bruce Lee's hand, hands, more of a, I mean, he did use weapons. He did use the nunchucks and he did use some stuff, but it didn't become as, as, you know, um, as co codified, I should say, as, uh, as say the empty hand system is, is, um, so, uh, I wanted to bring on Guru Billy Brown uh, and talk about his history, but also talk about kind of weapons training and kind of the, the world of JKD in which he lives in and the weapons training he does because it's such an important part of completing and becoming the whole martial artist. So Guru Billy, Billy Dan, thank you for joining me today. Hi. Glad to be here. Awesome. I'm, I'm glad you agreed to be here too as well. So I always like to start to show off by, you know, talking about your background. Um, you know, especially if it's the first time you've done an, inter in, done an interview with me, the next time we won't go through your background. But this first time, I just want to let my audience kind of know a little bit about your history, what got you involved in the martial arts, you know, how old you were, what was the first martial arts you studied, all the way up to your progression of today. So take it away. All right, uh, it's kind of unique, in fact. And my father started me at a very young age. My mother says I was around three. Uh, I, of course, don't have memories that early. My memories start around, you know, six years old, probably. Um, but my mom and dad were divorced, so when I would go home with him and spend the entire summer with him, the, the training was the way we bonded, so to speak. And uh, when my dad passed away when I was uh, 11 years old, I went through a huge depression. And my mom got this bright idea. She's like, uh, you know, they had this huge connection through the martial arts. So she threw me a phone book one day and she says, pick a school. And I'm like, okay, well, I didn't know. All I knew was what my dad had showed me. So I, I picked the local Taekwondo school, which by the way, ended up being a good pick for me. Uh, it wasn't the Taekwondo that we see today. Uh, it was run by a man who had a handicap. Uh, he had polio as a, as a young man and the whole right side of his body was, was, pretty much paralyzed uh, so he he didn't get into the competition side he got into the side where I want to hit you hard I want to hit you quick and I want to get the hell out of there so that's the kind of type one note that I saw so it was very reminiscent of my father in fact uh, so I was very uh, you know I was very fortunate uh, uh, that way and and so to this day I, I don't regret my Taekwondo training and I, I I'm very lucky I still hang out with some of the highest level Taekwondo men in the world uh, and, and, and I befriended them and, uh, you know, are close to these people. Um, so basically what got me into the more, you know, what got me into the more uh, modern martial arts, so to speak, uh, was I was 14 years old. I got beat up on the playground by a 17-year-old. Now, at, that, at 14, I was already an athlete. I, was, I could jump and kick a basketball rim. I mean, uh, you know, fastest man on the block, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this kid, I, I remember sidekicking him, and I caught him with the first one, and it hurt him. And I could tell him, I'm going to do that same sidekick, but he, he knew that sidekick was coming again, right? Right. So he caught it, he flipped me, and he punched me in the back of the head until they broke it up. So he didn't really hurt me, but he hurt my ego, so to speak, you know? Right. So I, I started questioning everything. I'm like, how did this happen? I'm, you know, I have such great kicks and, 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 and all this, and, uh, so I remember the next week walking into my Taekwondo school, um, 
Mm-hmm. And I, I lived in school. I, I would my mother would drop me off as soon as as soon as school was over. She would just drop. I, I was raised by martial art instructors. <laughs> you know, I really right on. Yeah, yeah. She would drop me off at four o'clock and not come get me till ten o'clock at night. You know. Uh-huh. Um. So. Uh, uh, I walked in kind of with my, you know, tail stuck between my legs, so to speak, my head down. In the same time when I was school, I remember going around the corner, and I remember looking into the dojang and seeing this little older round gentleman headbutting people and choking them with sticks and 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 and, and double leg tackles and mounts and uh, ground and pound. And I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> right up to him, and apparently this guy. Uh, you know, this guy, you know, had trained Jeet Kune with some big names. He trained Kali with some big, very big names. Uh, and I walked up to him and said, you have a student. And the rest is kind of history. His name is Ron Gowen. I have to give him credit. He started my kind of path into the combatus, so to speak. And uh, mm-hmm. from there, I just researched and I tried to train with everybody I could. Um, right. As far as the arts, as far as the, those arts went. And, uh, mm-hmm. and yeah. Yeah, the rest is history, I guess. Right on. Did you have any trouble going from one school to another? Uh, no, not at all. It, it, it was. I've always been unique. My Taekwondo instructors were always a little upset with me because I would always take the Taekwondo students to the back and show them some trapping, or at least trapping what I thought at that time period. You know. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and I would always. I, so I was always dabbing and other stuff, and I, I think that was from my father. He was. You know, I never really got to sit down and go, what styles do you do, you know? But mm-hmm. uh, from talking to my uncles later on as I grew up, you know, he, he did he did an Okinawan style, uh, and he did he did a blend of Western boxing with it, and uh, he loved weaponry. He, he worked weapon. I, in fact, I actually saw my father fight one time. Uh, I, was about, yeah. I was about 10 years old, and, uh, and my father had a bad habit of uh, – bringing in strays, so to speak, <laughs> you know, oh, he would yeah. help people, you know, he would help. Now this is to keep in mind, this is new Orleans, Louisiana. That's where I'm from. So if you, okay. if you know anything about Louisiana, it's not the cleanest, healthiest state in the world, probably. And, uh, uh, so he would bring these people off these drug addicts and these, you know, and he would try to help them. And he brought this one person in and I'll never forget. He was fixing me macaroni and cheese. And this guy just jumps out of one of the bedrooms and, and my dad's trailer with a damn machete and I'm over and my dad just looks at me like it then looks at this guy like my son's here and uh and he grabs a broom and whips the hell out of this guy with a broom so wow it, it this that stuck in my head my entire life you know mm-hmm. so uh, so he was very adverse in weaponry uh even the term dirty boxing I was hearing in the 80s and people now I think that's a new term Everybody's coming yeah. out with a dirty boxing video series. I mean, I have one right. to I get it, you know. Uh, right, right. Um, but that's not a new term. And, and, and people, when they hear dirty boxing, they automatically think FMA, Filipino mm-hmm. martial arts. You know, people were using dirty, you know, the, the term dirty boxing has been around long before me, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, so, so I was hearing that term through my uncle. So I think that my dad put that in my system early on, and he didn't do it on purpose. You know, I'm sure he had no clue that I would still be doing – martial arts 33 years now you know he had no clue about that right but uh but he put it in my mind and in my heart to kind of question everything in the seat kind of you know you know the whole bruce lee philosophy i think i think he did that very subconsciously uh, mm-hmm. so i've always kind of questioned everything i've always questioned what instructors have told me i've always questioned training methods and uh and i've always tried to reevaluate things and then try to make them better or at least better for me so right right yeah that's that's interesting the um the the taekwondo my um my background is in tongsudo that Mm. was the first well that's not the first it's a long story i have a long story i have a longer story we're not here to hear about me but uh you know just real quickly um the the first style i got my black belt in back in like the late 90s was um no, mid nineties. I can't remember my certificates back on the wall there, <laughs> but I'll look at it one of these days. It was called the white dragon martial arts system. And okay. it, and it was basically a mixture of like Tonksudo, five animal Kung Fu and Aikido. That was like basically what it was. Uh, and then I went into J G Kundo after that. And my JKD instructor was also studied Taekwondo. 
Okay. He studied JKD first. Oh, interesting. And then, like, he was in the Army, though, but then, and then as he was in the Army and stationed different places, he would, he would like, learn, like, wherever he was. Gotcha. And so he learned uh, Taekwondo from some people high level. He said they had some just amazing kicks. Yeah. And when he taught me, it was kind of, you know, this was back in the 90s and we didn't have the internet. I couldn't just pop up yeah. online. You know, I learned this mix of JKD and Taekwondo from him. Uh, and it's still kind of hard to tell, you know, what part, you know, was the JKD part. Because he didn't like to explain, oh, this is a Taekwondo kick, yes, this is a JKD. Yeah. He just kind of, you know, presented it to me all kind of as one system. Um, so, I, yeah, I identify with what you're saying that the, that the Tong Sado is, is, he didn't actually even correct my kicks. He, he did, he, we went on to other stuff because he's like, well, you already have your kicks down, of course. Oh. Kind of taekwondo system. He's like, well, you have your kicks down. Let's work on trapping. So that was a big deal, but I understand what you're saying. You know, you're saying, "Hey, the the Taekwondo has fed into it has fed into my JKD." Well, it, so, it's it, it's funny. It, it, it's it's kind of fed into everything a little bit because, like, you know, and I sometimes I get crucified for saying this, but very few good JKD kickers today. Very very yeah. few good ones. Okay. Yeah. Um, to the point where I the a couple months ago I had a known JKD instructor. Uh, mm -hmm. not one of the more, not one of the more popular ones, but he's, he's known. Uh, he sent me a message and, uh, on one of my kicking videos and he, <laughs> he's like, man, these are great kicks, but I thought you were a real Jikuno man. His exact <laughs> words. He goes, real Jikuno men don't kick above the waist. Yeah. And I right. Just, it, 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 you know, it just, it, it, you know, it caught me off guard. Um, Kicking's a lost art, and the reason why people don't do it is because it's so hard to get good at. Mm -hmm. you know, right. Kick ourselves. Right. Fighting should be easy. Training mm -hmm. should be complicated and challenging. You know, so yeah. the reason why these people are criticizing kicking and stuff is because they can't do it because they don't right. train. You know, they don't train it. And, uh, and it, I, I, yeah, I, I, well, I train MMA. You know, currently is what I'm. I mean, I train Jeet Kune Do all the time, but my Jeet Kune Do does really well at MMA and. Let me tell you something. There are lots of times where I'm kicking people in the head and they don't expect That's right. it. Awesome. Yeah. 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 So it served me well. Sounds like it served you well. Now, did you have any ch challenges as you were kind of moving forward? And you said you had this mentality of, hey, let's, you know, it was like the Bruce Lee mentality that I think a lot of people adopt without really even knowing that, it, that, that you know, Bruce did it. You know, yeah. it's, just, it's just a mentality of, hey, I want to know what actually works. Yeah. Exactly. Did, you, did you run into any challenges with that as you were progressing in your martial oh, arts? I've always been hungry for knowledge. And I think that's what keeps me training the way I do and keeps me, you know, 33 years now through major, major injuries that should have probably ended my career. Um, running a martial arts school for 25 years almost. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm constantly wanting to learn more. I'm constantly wanting to refine what I know. Um, so I think the only challenges have been the Jeet Kune Do work can get very political. And mm -hmm. when I knew that my foot was getting in that door and it probably went subconsciously, it probably went me putting a Jeet Kune Do video online and people looking at it and going, oh, this kid maybe knows something, you know, or mm -hmm. maybe has something to offer the Jeet Kune Do community. And that's how it probably started. Not me just going, oh, look, I'm a Jeet Kune Do instructor. I want you to follow me. Um, so I think it started very – accidentally but then when I knew my foot was getting in the door of that world I promised myself to stay out of the politics it's to the point where it's so much where main named Jeet Kune Do instructors know that I, I I'm a middle guy and mm -hmm. you can ask people that are close to me here I'll get messages from this guy and I'll get messages from this guy and they're talking about each other and they don't mm -hmm. you know they're asking me what I think you know because right. I'm a neutral guy so to speak, you know, I stay out of the politics side of it. Right, right. I want to be able to perform the art, and I want to be able to understand it enough to teach it. That's my mm -hmm. only goal when yeah. it comes to Jeet Kune Do. And it's cost me certificates. Let me tell you, it's cost me certificates from from, yeah. from well known people. But those paper accomplishments like that don't mean don't matter as much to me as being able to perform it and understand it. Sure, sure, me too. I mean, I I completely understand. It's it's kind of weird when you talk about the politics. Of, of JKD because I came I, I came into it kind of the politics side of it really really super late like I'm even still learning some of the politics because 
I, I learned JKD back in, like I said, like the 90s, mid, mid-ish 90s. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm for, I was from a, s- a small town, still am, and I had my JKD instructor, but he didn't like present it to me like, oh, well, there's these people who do this and these people gotcha. who do that. I had no idea. He just showed me the system and the philosophy yeah. that went with that system. And then later it was like, oh, are you this JKD? Are you that JKD? Are you what? I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I learned from this guy who learned from Abel Sandoval, who learned from, yeah. Um, yeah. who learned from the Oakland school, you know, who learned from Steve Johnson. You know, I mean, I know who, who taught who, I guess that puts me somewhere, but I was just like, I have no, I, I don't even know why we're fighting guys. What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I, and, and it's that an art that that was so what's the word an art that was so open and ever growing has developed some of the most closed minded practitioners than any other system yeah you know, it's sad when you think about it like that you know yeah yeah certainly is people certainly that is. people that prefer to talk and, and bicker about stuff that doesn't matter than than to actually train you know <laughs> which is the right. most kind of yeah yeah. Well, you know, the people who talk about it, and I know some some people who do, and they do it because they they care. There are some people who, you know, you know, and I know them, they're just looking for, sure. for a fight. That's all they're doing. They're looking for a fight. And then after, you know, you can tell those people, it's just like when there's no one left to fight, they turn on their own, you know? It's just like, it's just like the sheep and the wolves kind of thing, you know? It's like the, a wolf will, uh, you know, uh, somebody will fight off wolves, and, but when they fight off wolves, then they turn on the sheep. You know, it's just like they're they're interested in fighting, not in truth. That's right. And but then there's some people who are like, you know, they, they they actually for some reason they feel in their heart that they care about about. It. And I can respect that. I respect both. I just I'm like you. I don't want to get involved. I'm like that's cool. You like that? You want to set that straight, man? You set it straight. But you know, that's I'll give you my opinion, but it's just my opinion. That's why I call my that's why I call my system Ronin JKD. You know, yeah. there's a story behind that, but it's Ronin JKD. I, I'm not affiliated with any particular yeah. JKD lineage or system. So, yeah, yeah it becomes interesting. Now, let's let's focus in here because uh, I am very interested in talking to you about your background in weapons training. Uh, and particularly knife training. And on one of your videos, you showed a scar from a knife attack yeah. or a fight. Yeah. So you're, you're, I always, when somebody says, hey, I, I had uh, uh, <laughs> Kevin Sikor on from, from uh, he's a, a combat uh, system yeah. guy, and he's been stabbed twice yeah. uh, in a real fight. And anytime somebody's actually been stabbed or sliced or actually dealt with a knife, I'm like, I want to listen to this guy not the theorists who's never done it, you know, who knows all the, I want to, I want to be a theorist because I don't ever want to meet a guy with a knife, <laughs> but I don't yeah, want, yeah. you know, I want to learn from somebody who actually, who actually got, got attacked or actually had to deal with it. So tell us a little bit about that story. If you don't, if you don't mind going well, into it. Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, well, my background's unique with that. As a, as a young man, 18, I started wanting to test myself. So I said, well, let's become a bouncer. Let's work in club. Let's work in the club industry. And at the time, I had a, I had a school. I opened up my first school when I, I was almost 18. I had I lied about my age to sign a lease. I was 17 and a half, you know. And uh, it, was in, it was right outside of New Orleans, Louisiana, about 25, 30 minutes outside of New Orleans. And uh, so I said, well, let's work in the club field. Let's, let's, let's start. I'll just, so I said, what's the greatest place to start your – your green life of, of a club doorman, New Orleans, Louisiana. Stupidest decision of my life, let me tell you. Um, so I started working. Uh, I started working clubs back in 1998, probably. And uh, so right away, you learn how much you don't know. You learn about yeah. the psychology of, of of the fighting, which the psychology of the fighting will shut a fighter down, or it will shut somebody down who thinks they're a fighter. Okay. And okay. we've seen it, we've seen it so many years. I, I, I spent 17 years on club doors. Uh, I retired about three years ago. <clears throat> uh, um, and I saw, I saw named MMA guys just get demolished by no name 45 year olds. Just because mm-hmm. they didn't quite understand the psychology of, the, of, 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 of what was going on. Um, so during those 17 years, 
couple hundred fights probably, not bragging by any means. Um, I was cut three times. Uh, one was across my face, the scar you probably saw. Uh, yeah. and it, it's, it's, been, it's been about seven years now, so it's healed up well, but my cheek actually fell and touched my shoulder uh, when he cut me. Now, now, what's funny is I thought that he punched me. I didn't know that that, that kind of damage was there because my whole side of my face went numb and I couldn't hear. So I, I felt it, and I turn around, and this eye is even blurry for, was even blurry for some reason, and he just stops and starts backing up, and the other bouncers immediately grabbed him. And I just ran and climbed him and started doing my thing. And right. finally, one of the bouncers says, stop, we got to get to the hospital now. And I'm like, no, he doesn't need a hospital yet, but he's going to. And he goes, he shook me a little bit. He goes, no, you do. And then that's when I kind of went back to reality. And people were actually taking their shirts off because they were, they were literally covered in my blood. I lost a liter and a half of blood, believe it or not. Whoa. I didn't know you could lose that much damn blood. Um, so, uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Later and a half, 30, 39 stitches. <clears throat> yeah, inside. Wow. Yeah. That's so that crazy. Was the worst, that was the worst one. Yeah, the worst so, one. So tell me, as you reflect on that, because I'm thinking about lessons. Yeah. But I want to hear what kind of lessons do you think you, you learned from, from that encounter? This, this is what the training does. First off, 30 years, well, at that point, 20, you know, a good solid 25 years in combatants training didn't mm -hmm. stop that from happening. That's yeah. the first thing people should realize. You know, if mm -hmm. somebody wants to cut you, it's relatively likely that's probably going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you don't need to see it. You, you'll never see the blade. You know, and I, I've had to use my blade twice in altercations, and we can get into some of that if you want to also. But but you you, you, you won't even see the blade uh, mm -hmm. most times. Um, so what the training did does – it, it helped me fight through that though. It didn't shut me down. See, the problem mm -hmm. is when people that they get they get injured and they they get shut down, mm -hmm. and they, they it's almost like they they're in their mind they're dead. You know, mm -hmm. you're not dead. You just got to go through that. And I think the train I think the training's important with that because it teaches you to move forward. And that's one of my mantras: keep moving forward, so to speak. And it, yeah, right. I think talk about that in life and in combat. You know, keep mm -hmm. moving forward. You know, so I think the training's important. I think the weapons training is so important today because if I wouldn't have had a knife in my hand or if I wouldn't have been presented with a blade so many times in the classroom, that I, that would have been totally alien to me. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm bleeding bad. What do I do now? You know, yeah. but I understood, I understood the game, so to speak, a little bit. Uh -huh, right. So, so I understood how to work through that a little bit. Yeah. And, and did that, did the, did the knife encounters then change your, um, uh change change at all how you interacted in your yeah in your training and uh, uh the, the first time i was cut I, yeah it, it changed a lot because i, I train with a blade more people used to okay. go why do you I, why do you have a blade in your hand every time i see you and it's because i'm scared to death of, a, of getting cut again mm -hmm. you know? right. so, so i want to get so familiar with the way it feels with the way the body moves with the way uh because let me tell you a little secret about weapons training. The only way to learn to defend against it is to learn mm -hmm. to use it. Bottom line. There's no right. – and that's where other arts miss the, miss the boat a little bit. And I'm not going to – because I have people that I, you know, train in other systems that get me to, you know, to, to come up to them and train them. So I'm not going to mention arts per se. But other arts, you'll see a lot of pictures and magazines where they're blocking a knife and they're punching. And all that looks great on that magazine cover but mm -hmm. what they're missing is they don't understand the way a knife actually moves mm -hmm. if you don't understand the way right. a knife actually moves your responses that you're taking these pictures of aren't going to be they're not going to be realistic at all yeah right you know? right and that's where other arts miss it they don't train with the blade they just try mm -hmm. to defend against the blade right right yeah i think that's that's way important let me just tell you a couple things that occurred to me as you told that story and then uh, you can, you know, riff on it a little bit. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me is that, you know, you like you already said, you, you probably won't see the blade coming when it comes out. Okay. You, you just won't. It'll, you know, it can slice you. And it can be easy. And then plus, a lot of times you don't even know you're cut. You know, I've heard this before. You don't, you don't know your cut from what you're saying. But the other thing that kind of occurred to me is you said the guy kind of dropped and, and looked back. And that kind of like, that that's played into 
my my experience with training with the blade the limited experience that i had and that is not everybody is psychological they think they're psychologically ready to take the blade out and kill you you know if they have to be a badass but when they actually see what they what what can happen you know it's not like he 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 was he was scared you know he was he was scared it takes a lot of nerve to to actually cut somebody with the blade and then continue to cut them until they're dead. And, 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 uh, and I, I, didn't, I didn't complete that part of the story too. When I turned around and I seen him back up and he turned white as a piece of paper. And I thought he was, I thought he was like, Oh, this big ass Cajun's about to whip on me. That's why I'm scared. But no, what he really saw was this yeah. cheek hanging off and bone and nerves squirt, squirting blood is what, is what he really saw. But right. I didn't know that at the time. You get right. what I'm saying? So he realized right away that it wasn't, it wasn't like the movies. I didn't right. just, I just didn't get cut and disappear, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and, and the thing is, is people have to understand that it takes a certain psychology to use a blade. I mean, to actually use it in a fight where you have to be the one, you know, stabbing or slicing the other person. It isn't that easy. One of the things that we trained with that kind of opened my eyes to it is, um, it's not, it's not, if you have it and you know how to use it, it's a great equalizer, but that's a different story than having the psychology of actually having it or the dexterity of having it. When you're in a fight, your, your nerves or your adrenaline's up, you know, your, your fine motor still kind of go out the window. And one of the drills that me and a friend of mine used to, used to do was we used to do this thing. It's kind of like sticky hands, but not exactly. The, the person would basically go like this and then I would go like this and we would kind of dance around and then he would go for the knife. Then he would go for the knife and we would try to jump and grab before, before he would get to the knife. But I, even sometimes when I would grab the knife, Billy, I would drop it. I wouldn't always, it wouldn't always come out like clean or whatever. You know what I mean? It would sometimes it'd fall on the ground. You know, it's just like, it's not like this 100% you carry a knife, you're Mr. Badass universe, you know? So you, but you've done both sides, right? So riff on that for a little bit for well, me. Tell me what you think. The repetition, man, is so important. And people talk about it every day in the martial arts world. Instructors talk about it, but they really don't know what they're talking about even. They don't put enough emphasis on it. Uh, yeah. Repetition, you know, I tell my students repetition breeds habit and habit is the mother of skill. Um, so one of the biggest thing, and you know, skip, skipping a story to one of the times I had to use my blade. Um, yes, please. Um, I was badly, badly injured. Uh, I was jumped by four guys, and in a freak accident, uh, it was pouring down rain. I was on a wooden deck at a college club uh, here in town. I'm in a big college town, so the spots we worked here were either uh, you know football players or MMA fighters, or at least they had a tap out shirt. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so. Uh, so I did my normal thing, which is clinch and elbow. That's my that's my go to, and uh, I. In freak accident, my, my right leg slipped, and I blew my rectus femoris out. My <laughs> biggest muscle in your leg just blew it. Boom. Uh, most pain I've ever felt in my life, and still to this day, I'm in, I'm in pain, chronic pain for the rest of my life. I'm in pain as we speak. Uh, mm -hmm. Doctors say that I shouldn't be walking, much less kicking people in the head, you know? <laughs> right, um, right. Yeah, yeah. So, well, they didn't know that, obviously. They thought they just had me. So, I remember being on one knee, most pain, I mean, blurry pain, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And they just kept punching. And uh, the young lady I was with, she hit one too, and uh, she slipped. Everybody just slipped on this deck. This thing was like an ice rink. It was so slippery. Mm -hmm. And I think they just painted it, so I think the paint they used had some kind of reaction to the water or something, and it just made it extremely slippery. So everybody was just falling, man. And she hit one and slipped, and he was kneeling on her, had me in a rear neck and choked, and his buddies, two to three other guys, just kept punching on me. And at that point, I just said, I remember saying three times, you win. I, I quit. Just get me to the hospital. You know, that, right. was all, that was the only thing in my mind. And finally, when I knew that this wasn't going in, I, I was worried about, because to be honest with you, I thought my knee had blown. I didn't know it was the muscle. I thought my knee had blown. Yeah. And uh, um, so I knew it was going to get worse. I knew that I was going to probably get hurt even more if this kept going. So I said, I got to end it. So back to repetition, it was acquisition of that blade just, just went in and they never seen it. Uh, I pulled it out. I actually flipped it over to reverse grip in a milliseconds under pain, under distress. 
And the next punch that came in, I just ran it through, and it, it went right through the web of his hand. Uh, and it, he, he looks at it and passes out like a little baby. And, uh, and it was so fast, they thought I, they thought I, you know, it was like, he killed Bobby, so to speak. You know, I mean, <laughs> they thought I gutted this guy. Because they yeah. never, all they saw was blood. And this yeah. kid had been drinking profusely, so his blood was very, very thin. So it looked yeah. like a lot of it. But it was a damn, it was a little hand. It was a poke. It went completely through, but you get what I'm saying? Right, yeah, yeah. So he passes out. And they ran. The knife did the job. You know, the next day, the detectives came to my academy, and within five minutes, they ruled it self-defense. And yeah. he turned off the recorder, and he looked at me. He goes, this is why. He goes, he goes, let me ask you a question. He goes, could you have killed everybody on that deck if you needed to? I said, yeah. And I, if I needed to, I could have and would have. He goes, the reason that you didn't is the reason why you're not going to jail. He goes, you mm -hmm. only did what you needed to. You used the tool to get the job done. And that's right. why – we use the term injuring to degree and we use okay. it with the weaponry and we use it with the empty hands. I only want to injure to degree. Now it might be ferocious degree. I might get the job done very quickly in a ferocious manner, but it's going to only be enough to neutralize you. So I can get the hell out of there. I see. I see. So um, what do you think about um, G Kundo and the knife training? How I, I think that there is uh, a more leaning towards uh, Filipino martial arts in because there's similarities to um, to JKD and Wing Chun. There's trapping. There's you know there's that kind. There's there's the knife tapping system looks a lot like you know trapping type of stuff. And so I think that there was you know it's it's easy to take FMA and and bring it into into JKD. Um, uh, you know, there was some other than like a, the stance and some things like that. My limited time in FMA, I did about six months in Sayak Kali. Okay. Um, and uh, and there were some things I was just like, well, they're using Tan Sao and Pak Sao and Lop Sao. You know, they're they're using these things that basically look like Wing Chun JKD stuff. And I think that's probably the reason why a lot of JKD people use FMA. Um, is there, do you, do you, have you had any trouble blending the two or is it not even a, you know, what's your, what's your, your, uh, your background on that or your take start, on that? Let me start here. This, this alone is a very controversial subject in, okay. in, in no world. Okay. And I, I like to talk about it because I, I want people to kind of understand where, where I think it's, uh, misinterpreted and why I think it's important. Uh, like you say. Um, but it's very controversial because now you have people growing up thinking, I'm going to train Jeet Kune Do, and they, they go, and I hear it all the time, I'm going to train Jeet Kune Do. I can't wait to do the sticks. So, so, so they're, they're, they're missing the element. You know, I'll never forget the first time I trained with Gurdana Lasano. Uh, I was very lucky because I, I had a bunch of, uh, of kind of big names there. Uh, uh, Sensei Eric Paulson was actually uh, assisting him. And this was kind of the last tour that Eric was with him before Eric opened up his Orange, Orange County location. And, and it, you know, it was one of those very last tours. This was probably 2000. And uh, it's been from my first instructor, uh, Guru Ron Goins, and it was very uh -huh. jab, jet tech, very, you know, figure jab front kick. That very, very, you know, that he added it into his program, you know, so it wasn't, the complete art, so to speak. Okay. Okay. And then I went to the PFS route, the Vunak route. So that was my mm -hmm. experience with Jikino at that time. So I remember being in the gym training, and I remember uh, I think I think we were doing a jab, and we would do split entry to to, to pop da. And mm -hmm. instead of the split entry, I did the vertical, the the horizontal gunting. Yeah. That the Vunak, you know, that the PFS guys do, which is which is solid. Yeah. But I remember Eric coming up to me from behind me. He goes, don't do that in here. He whispered. And, and I'm like, well, he goes, because that's Kali. We don't repeat. We well, don't want to see. We don't want to let the people see us blending it. Okay. <laughs> now, now, this is what that meant. Guru Dan gets so much slack from the Jeet Kune world because they all say he adds the Kali to it. Mm -hmm. Or he adds the Jeet Kune to the Kali. Yeah. And then he gets so much slack from the FMA world because he adds the JKD to the, you know, or the FMA to the right, JKD. Right, right, now, most right. of these people giving him slack have never even trained with him in a seminar. 
Okay. Mm. But they're assuming this because the man trains in so much stuff. Right. Right. So he's actually gotten penalized over the years for wanting to train in other arts. It's very, it's very, it pisses me off actually. You know, it, yeah. they don't get it. You know, they don't quite understand it, but they want to bicker about this or that. So when we say we blend, I, I watch what I say that. I watch what I say. I blend the Kali with the Jikuno because I want my Jikuno to be, I want it to look like Bruce Lee's Jikuno, but I also want it to go where I think he would have evolved it. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, you want it to look like you. You know, I mean, I think that's that's the thing is you yes. want it to look like you. Yes. Yeah, because you know. see, if, if an art doesn't evolve, it dies. I mean, that's right. just the way. If anything doesn't evolve, it dies. Mm -hmm. So these guys that say, let's train the exact way he trained in 71, they're missing the boat big time. I mean, are you telling me this man would still look the way he did in 1971 if he was still alive? Come on. Man. Look from 66 to 72. He looked, he was two different people. Yeah. You know, two yeah. different people. So with that said, I think that everything complements everything. And if mm -hmm. you look at it just from a martial art point of view, the FMA is going to complement Jeet Kune Do. How could it not? How, you're mm -hmm. working on different stressors. You're working on different uh, uh, footwork, different angulation. Uh, all this is going to make it better. It makes it a different beast, so to speak. Mm -hmm. okay? That's why you got to do the Muay Thai. You got to do the striking. You got to have a good ground. You got to have a good solid groundwork. Mm -hmm. All of it complements the whole, so to speak. Right. But I don't try to say that Jeet Kune Do is Kali. Does that make right. sense? Right. Yeah, try yeah. To stay away from that. Okay. Yeah, right. Now, when you talk about it from a combatives point of view, you get into a whole new different subject, because okay. the combatives isn't the art per se. Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta have the art, you, and you gotta have the. Yeah, Vunak used to say you gotta have the self perfection and the self preservation. You mm -hmm. gotta do them both. Have you heard that term? Of I'm sure you've heard that through the years. You gotta have the self perfection and the self preservation. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about combat. A finger jab, where did I get that from? Is that a Jeet Kune finger jab or a Kali finger jab? You know, yeah. a headbutt, where is that from? Is that a Jeet Kune headbutt or a Kali headbutt? Right, you know? right. Um, so I think that it all complements each other, and I think you have to do it. And But I also think in the world we're living, if you neglect weaponry, you're mm -hmm. missing the boats because so many attacks involve weapons. All of the hundreds of altercations I've seen over a long, painful 17 years working clubs, let me tell you something, a weapon could have been – brought into the game, every one of them. They were at arm's length. Bottles, sticks, pipes, bricks, uh, everything. I was very yeah. fortunate that it, I was only presented with a weapon a couple times. But right, it right. could have been there at any moment. Does that mm. make sense? Oh, yeah, so yeah, if, for sure. So if you have a high percentage rate of a weapon possibility and a very low percentage rate of schools in America training weaponry, you see the problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So, right. yeah. For sure. So tell me, what do you think like um, a good, um, well-rounded, particularly knife weaponry uh, system should entail? You know, somebody's listening and they're like, OK, I need to get in the knives. I'm doing, you know, maybe I'm at a karate school or, you know, even at some you know, like a Wing Chun school or something like that. And they're like, yeah, that was actually <laughs> not to piss anybody off, but that's actually one of the reasons I left Wing Chun. So I went up all the way through the empty hand system and I was looking at the weapons. And I was just like, I'm just not interested. I'm just not interested. And that's when I went over to Saya Kali. Um, but it just, it was, you know, a little archaic. It seemed like archaic. And I, I'm not bagging on it. That's cool. A lot of people do it. A lot of people can, you know, filter it into and, and adapt it to a real life thing. Um, but I was just looking, I was like, I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in learning that right now, you know? I'm yeah. interested in learning something that I'm actually going to run into and I'm not going to run into an eight foot pole. I'm not going to run into a huge butterfly blade. So yeah. I was just like, uh, and there were other things too. I'm like, uh, I, I learned the empty hand system and I'm, I'm very quite satisfied with that. But so, so someone like me or, you know, somebody out there like that and you're, you have the chance to speak to them and they're saying, Hey, look, um, this is what you would need to know. You know, these are the things that these are the, the, the principles I would want to pass on to you either for looking to a school or training in your own garage. What, what would you say? Are you there? Did we lose you? Uh oh, lost him at a critical point. Uh oh, oh, well, this world is not new. All right, stick with me, folks. I'm sorry about this, but uh, 
um, the I lost you. All right, folks, so this is part of what happens when we use the internet. We got the best technology available to us, but even that sometimes doesn't doesn't stand up to the test. So we might have to do a part two to this and splice them together if he doesn't. Oh, did he jump back on? Hey, are we back? Yeah, we're back. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened either, but that's technology. okay. Technology, technology. So did, did you hear my question? Did you? No, go ahead. Okay, so I was wondering, you know, what what would you pass on to the yeah. audience? Someone like me who, you know, wants to know more about knife fighting. What are some of the things that you'd say look for or some of the fundamentals if somebody wants to train in their garage with a knife, they don't have a school available? Gotcha. Or what schools would you go to? You know, go ahead. Um, this is the, the biggest problem today is people trading knife defense or knife fighting with arts that are not knife culture arts, you, they're, okay. they're, they're, tra they're, they're, they're training this stuff with, uh, uh, with people who don't understand how, how a knife really works. That's the number one problem. They're, they, I always say this, they're trying to force their art to answer the combative, the combative questions that it was never designed to be asked. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so okay. if you look, if you want to talk about a knife culture art, there's nothing that fits that better than FMA does. Bottom line, okay. nothing I found. And I've done Apache knife fighting. I've done I've done a lot of other World War II combatants. I've done a lot of other stuff. But the the the, the, the Filipinos understand the blade better than anybody. I think. Now, okay. does that mean every Filipino martial arts school is a good school? No. We all know that not all schools are created equal. We get it. <laughs> so, right. so so I think that research is paramount. I think that people need to stop taking the advice of others and seek to develop their own knowledge through research. I think that's okay. the biggest thing. We live in a world today where we want everything hand given to us. Mm -hmm. you know, like, make, like, like, what is it, Burger King, you know, your way right away type of thing, you know? Right, right. But in reality, it takes time. Let's research, man. You, if you go to my school website, I say that at the very beginning. Look, go, go train in other schools before you come train with me. I mm -hmm. want you to do it. Right. I want you to do that. Go trade with other schools. They come trade with me. And I want you to see the difference. Okay. Um, so with that said, I think the FMA is, is if you want to learn knife fighting, if you want to learn knife defense, I think FMA is where it's at. The second point is if you want to learn to defend against it, you got to train with it. You got to do it. Okay. You got to do yeah. it. That's, that's right. a, it, it's a double edged sword part in the pun. <laughs> because, <laughs> because if you, if you train with it, you learn to use it but you also get comfortable with knives around you. Mm -hmm. The more comfortable you are with a blade, when you're presented with that blade, you're not going to freak out and freeze. Mm -hmm. I remember doing disarms and all my instructors used to say, disarms don't work in real fights. Disarms don't work in real fights. Disarms don't work in real fights. And one night somebody stuck a knife in my face and I go, whoop, low line strip. And I had to stop and go, damn, did that just work? Did I just really? do that? Oh yeah. It, it, yeah. Was like, it was like all that repetition. Just, just, just took over, and it was insane. Over and over again. Over right. and over, thousands and thousands. That's the whole thing is you got to have you got to do you got to do the repetition. There's just no, yeah. no substitute for actually showing up and going to class. You know, That's do it. it over and over again. Then once you learn that repetition, you have to functionalize it. You yeah. have to actually yeah. put the gear on, put helmets on, and say, "Cut me with this trainer." Mm -hmm. and, uh, and let me see what, you know, you'll learn right away. Once you start sparring this stuff, and I hate using that term sparring, but it's, it's, it's a type of sparring. Once you start sparring this stuff, you'll learn right away what you're capable of doing right away, yeah. especially if you have a person really resisted and really tried mm -hmm. to come at you. And that's in yeah. anything, weaponry and empty hands. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've, we've said this on the program many times, and that is resistance training will will let you know where you're at. You know, yeah. it'll let you know what, what techniques work for you yeah. and your body type across any art, across yeah. any type of art. The, the acronym um, I use is this. I use an acronym. It's called TRIP, T-R-I-P. T. Okay, let's hear it. You're shown the technique. You learn the technique. Or you, repetition. Because repetition breeds habit, and habit is the mother of skill. Okay. Amen. Then I isolation. You isolate that technique, that strength, that training strategy, whatever. 
And then the one everybody forgets, P, you progressively introduce chaos. That's the key. You progressively introduce chaos to, to whatever you're training. Now, yeah. at, at, from a beginner, you put a stick in a beginner's hand and you start doing a basic coordination drill. That's progressively introducing chaos. That's scary as hell to a beginner sometimes. Mm -hmm. right, that's right. progressively introducing chaos. But as that person de starts developing a thicker skin through their training, then that progressively introduced a, int introduction of chaos needs to, to, to go to a higher level. Right. Where eventually you put the helmets on and you're, full, you're just going. You just full contact. Go with this thing. Mm. Vicious stuff. Vicious stuff. All right, well, we're coming up here on the end of the show, and I want to ask you what I ask all my guests, and that is if you could leave us with, and this kind of maybe already you already said it, but what are your three fight tips or training methods? Okay, so you can do training methods, fight tips. So if you had to say what are your free, three top fight tips, what would they be? Empty hands or with weaponry? Any Anything you any, – let's let, – well um, – let, I'll try to do it as a whole. Yeah, I'll try to either one, whatever. whatever. I don't want to limit you. You know, if you want to do six of them and do three and three, I don't care or, or yeah. whatever. I, um, um, I think it's important to develop the right mindset. And we're talking about empty hands or, or especially with weaponry. But I think it's important to develop the right mindset. Uh, I right. think sometimes people are afraid to – well, we, we hear through our everyday life, don't lose your temper. That's bad. You know, you hear, you see these memes on Facebook, real warriors are never mad. Oh, bullshit. When I got my face cut open and my thigh ripped in half, I was pissed off. I was pissed right. off. So real martial artists get mad. Real warriors get mad, but then we know how to challenge it productively to get the job done. And I think that's what's missing in today's combatives world or martial arts world is that people don't know how to use – what God has given us. They don't know how to use the adrenaline dump. They don't know how yeah. to use the the, 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 the the other chemicals that our body goes through in a life and death time is life situation. And, uh, and they just kind of just blah. Mm -hmm. I think you have to channel that. And I think you have to become something that we're not always. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, I, I teach little kids. I, I, you know, I, I, I try to do great things in my community but at the same time, I have that ability to turn on that switch when I need it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people when they say it. But I've worked on that my whole life. And I think the people, I call it the KI intensity dial, the killer instinct intensity dial. And you have to be able to manipulate that. And I think that's what's missing the most. People don't work on that mental game very often. They learn all the techniques they can, but then they get hurt on the street because they didn't know how to put gasoline to those techniques. Yeah, that makes right. sense. That, and then yeah, when the totally fight actually sense. happens, don't approach it with what I call the sparring mentality. Okay. Don't spar on the tar. Okay. okay? That's how. Right that's on. how. That's that's why black belts get beat up all the time. You hear stories. You've heard stories. Marshall, oh yeah, yeah. I've seen it firsthand. I've seen MMA champions just get. I've done it. <laughs> you know, people that really were younger, better shape. You know, that, that really, you know, could have just put me in the hospital, you know. But because I didn't approach it as a sparring mentality, I was lucky enough to walk away. Uh -huh. So you have to have that middle game, and then you have to learn to, 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 to turn it up, to put gasoline to it, I always say. And then you have to learn how to ferociously just get the job done and go home. Just go home. Okay. Yeah. Right on. I think that's the key, man. I think that with the, with this, was that three? Was that I don't know. Three? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, here's your third one. Here's your third one. Five. That was five. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Here, here's Here. your last one. Learn okay. to learn to strip what you're doing to the dirty core. I don't care if you're doing Oakland Allen karate. Learn to strip it to the dirty core and extrapolate just a few of those techniques or strategies or mindsets from that and functionalize that. Because anything okay. can work if you can pull it off. Anything can. Yeah. If you know how to right. strip it down to the – if I thumb your eyes, where, what art did I take that from? Who knows? I, I guarantee the old – those old cats were thumbing eyes way before me and you were ever around. You know what I mean? <laughs> so so learn to have a couple – I call it my black bag toolbox. Learn to put a couple things in that black bag toolbox that you know work consistently. Mm -hmm. And that's all you need because people, people when I say what I'm about to tell you, that sometimes it shocks them. 95 to 98 percent of what we train in the dojang or the dojo whatever you call it you'll never use in a real fight 
Oh yeah, yeah. That's the yeah. truth. You will never use it. We train that for the art. We train it for our bodies. We train it for health. We train it to keep us going. Mm -hmm. we train it for the art. Right. Yeah. But in reality, you're never going to use any of that. Yeah. You're going to have one or two things that you use every time that works consistently. You're going to stick to it. Right. Right. What always amazes me about like people who are like really good at street fighters, and I've met people like they 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 don't train martial arts, but they're like. They win like a lot of street fights. I've met people like this. They're, of course, I'm not talking about the BSers, yeah. but I'm talking about you know the real legitimate people who win a lot of street fights. They have like three techniques. So, like I've this one guy, he's like, okay, what I do is I go like this, and I step to the side, and I hit him in the face, right. and I kick him in the groin, and that's all he ever did in a fight. Yeah. And he won like most every fight he ever wow. encountered. You know, I mean, that was like his go-to move. He only had like three techniques. <laughs> you did, did judo guy. I, I did judo for about 20 years. I still love I still try judo and I incorporated it in my curriculum. Uh, uh -huh. but you look at a good judo guys, especially back in the 90s, they had two things that they would hit you with. And that's all they would hit them with, and they did it constantly. You know? and, and, and you know, they had two or three things, two or three little hip throws, two or three little off balances, and that they would just recycle them. Yeah. Yeah, just recycle them over and over. All right, thank you for All joining right. me. Stick, stick with me, uh, uh, okay. Mr. Brown. Um, afterwards, the show, I'll talk to you off the air for just a minute. I'm going to close out the show here. Awesome. Hey, everyone. And then, oh, tell everyone where they can find you online. Yeah, uh, just uh, just Google Progressive Martial Arts. I I'll come up. Uh, you can put in uh, Defend USA. I'll come up. But listen, it's www.empowerusa.net. Okay, that's how you find Guru Billy Brown on the interwebs. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to this podcast. If you liked what you heard, you know what to do. Please do us a favor and share this on your favorite social media. Leave us a review in iTunes or Stitcher Radio or Podcast One, wherever you heard this um, podcast. And you're always welcome to follow us on Facebook at Facebook forward slash The Empty Cup Podcast and Twitter at Empty Cup Podcast. And if you're really adventurous, you can follow me on YouTube. That's where I upload my training tactics and things like that. It's at Ronin JKD. So that's the only one that has a different name. Everything else is the Empty Cup podcast. But the YouTube channel is Ronin JKD. And I talk about a bunch of stuff on there. I do some vlogging. But I also do like videos, like videos on timing, videos on ground fighting, videos on trapping, all kinds of really cool stuff on there. So if you're looking to learn via the interwebs as best you can from me, Ronan JKD on YouTube. And until we meet again, please keep your gloves up. <laughs>